Inside the train. If you need to reach me in case of emergency, you can use the intercom located directly to the left of the doorway from which you've just entered. And now we can begin oh, our safari through the sky. I know, hi. Yeah. The Bronx Zoo is home to the Wildlife Conservation Society, that is the WCS for short. The WCS has eco guards and field scientists working all around the world to conserve and protect wildlife in wild places. We're going to see many examples of their of their work throughout the tour, starting right here in the South Kanha Meadow, full of a whole lot of animals. Folks, there are a lot of different kinds of animals to see here in this field, and we're going to tell you about all of them in like 30 seconds. So, to start off, we've got a, a small fawn that looks to be running in and out of a little muddy, little muddy, little muddy pond over there. It's over towards the back left of the exhibit in the shade. That is a Barasinga fawn. Now the Barasinga deer are the larger animals. They have antlers on. They have really big antlers on their heads, and that's actually where the name comes from. Because the word Barasinga means twelve times in Hindi. Now, if you see some smaller deer that have a darker brown coat with white spots all over it, those are the axis deer. We're passing some right in front of us. Axis deer are known to have their white spots for their entire lives, whereas most deer will shed them by the time they reach adulthood. And the other animals that we saw, they had, they were, oh, I believe we had the most out of all of the animals. We had mostly black buck Now those are the smallest animals. They've got kind of like a cappuccino coffee with cream color to them. Well, those are the females actually. Actually, the females don't have horns. The males have spiral-shaped horns that come to a point at the tops of their heads, and they have more of an espresso dark brown color. And as we go around this nice shady corner, I try to find a better place to stand, um, we are going to encounter some horses. And folks, just because I'm standing doesn't mean you should be, so uh, please remain seated. Us. And take a look over to the right because these are our Mongolian wild horses, also known as Perishwalski's horse. Mongolian wild horses are a very special horse species for many reasons. The chief among which being that they were once considered extinct in the wild. When animals extinct in the wild, that means they no longer exist in the wild. So for decades, 
The only place you could find a Mongolian wild horse was in a zoo in either North America or Asia. That is, until the 1960s, which is when all of those zoos came together, they created a plan to help the species survive. Part of that plan was to reintroduce the Mongolian wild horse back into their natural habitat, and we've been able to do that successfully so far. Of course, our work is not done yet. We will not rest until the Mongolian wild horse is truly wild again. For more information on how we're going to make that happen, let's hear from one of our coordinators out in the field. His name is Jonathan Slack. Hi. Farmer. Jonathan Slat, I'm the Russian and Northeast of Asia coordinator for the Wildlife Conservation Society. I believe that wildlife has a place on this earth. My job is to find practical solutions that allow people and wildlife to thrive together. The Trubalski's horse went extinct in the wild in the 1960s. On a recent trip to Kazakhstan, we thought about the ongoing and successful efforts in that country to bring these horses back to the Central Asian steppe. The world needs happy stories to watch the impossible become possible and to see hope restored. That's what's happening today with Peri Chowalski's horse. Now we got our very first Mongolian wild horses, also known as Peri Chowalski's horse, way back in 1902. And since then we've had over 50 foals born here. A foal is a baby horse, of course. Now, folks, we are making our way up this nice shady hill, and once we get to the top, we are going to encounter the world's largest species of wild cattle. In fact, you can start seeing them if you look over to the right, those of you in the front cars, those of you in the back, don't worry, keep looking to the right, you'll see them as well. They are our gower. Gower will grow up to six feet tall, ten feet long, and they can weigh up to 2,000 pounds. Okay. And they've got great big horns on their heads that allow them to defend themselves from all different kinds of predators, including tigers. Now, we do have a very large gower herd, but that's not necessarily representative of how, of how their population is in the wild. Because they're considered a vulnerable species. Vulnerable is just a step above danger. We are adding to their population though slowly but surely. Last year we had six or seven calves born here at the Bronx Zoo. Now male horns point straight up in the air while the females have more to see shit. There is no point in working towards each other. Let's hear from one of our zookeepers. His name is Dave. Dave takes care of his yower every single day besides the days that he doesn't. And he's going to tell us a little bit more about him. I am Dave. Oh, I'm 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 Dave. Oh,
And since Anakin was at, at the top of the hill, that means Anakin has the high ground this time. Go check out more of our Amber Tigers over at Tiger Mountain, right here at the Bronx Zoo. And as we pass by this Rocky Muddy Hill, we're going to enter the Northern Kanha Meadow, the very first meadow that we encountered on the tour. And this meadow right now is home to a whole lot of peacocks. Peacocks are the males, peahens are the females. Peacocks are the fellas with the long, colorful feathers on their backs. They use those feathers to attract mates. Once they find a mate for the season, they're going to shed those feathers. So they're going back next year when the process begin all over again. They roam freely throughout the zoo, so it only makes sense that they are, they are over here. This is the time of year where they start to lay eggs, and in a few weeks we'll see some baby pea fowl or pea chicks hatched around the zoo. Pea chicks. You know, coming up on our right, we've got a bamboo thicket, and beyond the bamboo, we have our babarusa. The word babarusa means pig deer. Language a fitting title because they look a lot like pigs. Now over here on the left we've got Linus taking a nap with his straw. And then over on the right we've got Kenneth. Linus and Kenneth, or Kenneth is all the way over to the right hand side, making oh. himself hard to see as usual. They're both male, Babarusa, I know that, because they've got tusks growing out of their jaws. They use those tusks to fight other males and establish dominance in order to attract females. And now, oh, coming up that. on the right hand side, we have a couple of our Asian elephants. The one that we're going to see first, the one that is closest to us over here to the right, her name is Happy. And then the one that's just a little bit further away, her name is Patty. Happy and Patty are each over 50 years old, and they can wow. each eat 200 pounds of food a day. Mm. Some of their favorites include elephant, apples, elephant. oranges, and watermelon elephant, slices. Elephant, elephant. See, elephant. No, elephant, elephant. Water. So if you like to eat watermelon on elephant. a summer's day, you've got something in common with each other. And, elephant. folks, they, like, they can drink 60 gallons of water in a single day. Whoa. Whoa. So they are <laughs> they reach levels of hydration that, all, that I can only dream about. <laughs> now, they've got little finger-like appendages on their trunks, and they use those finger-like appendages for all kinds of things, including picking up grass and dirt from the ground. And they can even pick up heavy things like big tree trunks, mm. thanks to over 40,000 muscles in their trunks. Mm. Now, take a look down to the right, folks. You're going to find Priya and Patrick. They are Mama and Baby Rhino. They are both greater one-horned rhinos, and then they go take it's here, the land. Oh, oh, here comes oh, Patrick. Oh, 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 leave, but Priya's right behind him. They're running. They saw us. Now, Priya and Patrick, like I said, are both greater one-horned rhinos, also known as the Indian rhino. Priya gave birth to Patrick at the end of last year. After being pregnant with him for 16 months. And that's normal. That is the normal gestation time for oh. the greater one horned rhino. Now, they are covered in mud right now, folks. They are act that's for a really important reason. And it has to do with their skin. You see, rhino skin is very sensitive to the sun and to insects, just like our skin is. Although, instead of going to CVS and Spending twenty dollars on one thing of sunscreen, which I did yesterday, it was ridiculous. Um, instead of that, they sit in mud wallows, which are essentially really large and deep mud puddles, and they'll cover themselves with mud. And that mud will act as a natural sunblock and a natural bug repellent for them. Yes, we need to we can see an example of that over here on the right hand side. This is a mud wallow. That was built for the rhinos in the 70s, but Ooh. they've been, they've made it way larger ever since. And you can tell that because of those muddy footprints all around. Now, 
Priya and Patrick leave. Well, Patrick's going to grow up to be about 3,500 pounds. So, he can pretty much, he'll be able to mold and shape the land however he pleases. And that's how they create the mud wallows. WC. The rhinos you see here are Indian rhinos. Ooh. We work with habitats all over the world that are homes to rhinos. Here is a note from our field office in Sumatra and Ulan, who works with the Sumatran rhino. Sumatran rhinos are the smallest of the world's rhinos, and they are considered critically endangered. My name is Ulan Kuskari, and I'm the Species Conservation Specialist for WCS Indonesia Program. We carried out an island-wide survey of the last wild population of Sumatran rhinoceros in Indonesia. With so many unknowns on how to manage Sumatran rhinos in the wild or captivity, our studies show definitively that we must protect them at source. The cost of doing nothing could be the extinction of the species, and I can't imagine that. All right, folks, this next field is home to our sambar deer and our meal guy, Antelope. We're going to talk about the sambar deer. First, we have both males and females. The males have antlers on their heads, and they're going to grow to be about three feet long with up to three points per bar. Now, it's going to take them a couple of months for them to grow those antlers, but they should be fully grown by about July or August. They've also got a patchy coat because they're, believe it or not, they're still shedding their winter coat and growing out their summer coat. They're also the largest deer species in all of Southern Asia. Males will stand five feet tall at their shoulders and weigh 650 pounds. And they prefer to live alone in the wild while the females live in groups together. Speaking of groups of females, let's talk about our Neil guy antelope. We only have females in this exhibit. They've got big white spots on their behinds, white stripes around their hooves, and white spots on their ears. We can see our, our, actually we're first going to see a sandbar deer. If you take a look up towards the top right hand side of the exhibit. And then all the way in the top right hand corner we've got a mixed group of the sandbar deer and the Neil guy antelope. Now the word Neil guy means bull in Hindi and that's a reference to the males, which we don't have. The males have a bluish gray coat and horns so they resemble blue colored bulls. Now take a look over to the left once we enter this next exhibit, right up against that left fence, and in the leaves you're going to find a Chinese tufted deer. We've got a couple more in this exhibit. Keep your eyes peeled for them. They're very hard to find. Except for the one right in the middle that's making it really easy for us to see him. Um, they're very small. They only grow to be about 40 pounds, and they have a chocolatey brown coat that allows them to camouflage or hide very well in areas with a lot of dried up leaves and mud. We've got a guy over here to the right hand side also making himself easy to see. Now they prefer cooler temperatures so they're going to hang out in the shade all day probably. And they're nicknamed vampire deer because males have teeth that grow on the outside of their upper jaw and they come down and look like fangs and they're nicknamed vampire deer. Now folks, we are 35 feet above the mighty Bronx River. Just like the parkway that bears its name, the Bronx River is a highway for all kinds of animals, including alewood herringfish, red-tailed hawks, and more. Check out the Bronx River Alliance's website to learn about how, after centuries of pollution, the Bronx River is welcoming wildlife back once again. There's still a lot of work to be done, as you might have seen, but the Alliance has made considerable progress in that regard. Now, folks, this next exhibit is home to a whole lot of goats, but these are not your average goats. They are some of the largest goats in the world. Male Markour have long corkscrew-shaped horns, long beards, and manes of hair around their necks. Females have shorter beards, shorter horns, and no mane. The Markour are excellent climbers, thanks to a special set of rubber-like pores in their hooves. Okay. Those rubber-like pores allow them to climb up steep rock faces and eat trees. Markour have been known to climb trees for food, and they could also jump six feet straight up in the air without a running start. For reference, that's the height of the doorway that you used to enter the monorail. And now, folks, coming up on the right-hand side, we have Linus the Red 
panda hanging out up in this tree. Red pandas and giant pandas are not that closely related despite how similar their names are to the Jujubuki bamboo. Red pandas are more closely related to the skunk, the weasel, and the raccoon. So, next time you see a raccoon, you can tell him, Hey, I saw your cousin the other day. Now, if you'd like to see another red panda here at the Bronx Zoo, you can do that over at the Himalayan Island exhibit. It's not that far from here. Just turn right out of Asia Plaza. Watch out for the shuttle and walk for about 10 feet. 10 feet. 10 minutes. The Himalayan Highlands will appear on your left. Ah. Uh. Sorry about that, folks. Now, while you're here at the zoo today, you should go check out our treetop adventure that's over by Bronx River Parking. For just a little over 20 bucks per ticket, you can add a zip line to your day. You can zip over the Bronx River and through the trees, folks. It's really fun. If that's not enough for you, they've got rope courses of all different difficult places. It's a great time. Go check it out. Tell them John from Monorail sent you. I don't think you'll get a discount, but I don't know. <laughs> and folks, you should also check out our dinosaur safari while you're here. It's a walkthrough exhibit this year. Take a walk down our dino trail amongst our 52 life-sized dinosaurs. Wow, 52. That's great. Now folks, we're going to stop here temporarily. There is a train in the section of track in front of us, so we can't move until that train moves, and they're moving right now, so we're going to move in about 10 seconds. Just like roller coasters and regular trains, our, our monorail runs on a block system. And in the block in front of us, there is still a train. And there is no train in the block in front of us. They have moved on to the next one, so now we can move along. Now let me tell you a little bit more about our dinosaur safari. You can dig the fossils up there as well. Again, it's over by Astor Court and Fountain Circle. And it is a star attraction. Since you've got into the monorail, you can get into the dinos no problem. We've also got guides along the way to tell you all about our dinosaurs. And if you see a guide over there named Brian, tell him John from Monorail says hello. And now, folks, we're pulling up to the platform, which means the tour is about to come to an end. Thank you so much for joining us today on this lovely Woo! afternoon. Big round of applause for Stacy, everybody. Stacy, our driver doing great. My name is John. I was your tour guide and Stacy's over here. She was the driver. Please remain seated until we come to a complete stop and your doors open and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you, here John. Here the Bronx. the only zoo in the Bronx that I know of. Oh yeah, he's there. <laughs>